Um, thank you very much, Martin. Dr. Uh, John Rummel is the director of the East Carolina University's Institute for Coastal Science and Policy. Um, he's previously uh, served as uh, with NASA as the exobiology program manager and as a senior scientist for astrobiology. I think this might be the real men in black. Something like that. Something like that. Um, it's a fellow of the American Association of Advancement of Science and uh, also a recipient of Life Sciences Award from the International Academy of Astronautics, Dr. John Rummel. All right. Uh, thank you very much. It's good to be here as uh, one of Lynn's former projects. Um, it is the case that uh, for those of you who have heard about the butterfly effect, I think we heard in El Emily's talk this morning, uh, Lynn liked to uh, pour out the entire pen. Uh, I've been wearing this tie all day. It's nothing but butterfly wings, and it's good to see all the rest of the butterflies here. She kept a lot of butterflies moving over time. And occasionally she'd call up to uh, remind me uh, that there were actions available in life that could be a lot more fun than whatever I was doing. And the calls, uh, <laughs> you know, took the form of tasking usually, but they sounded a lot like this. Well, John Rummel, I guess this is East Carolina University, and you are the director of some policy institute. I don't know what town that is. It sure ain't Cape Cod. I will um, call you on your cell phone and look forward to speaking to you soon. Thanks. Bye. It was nice of her to call. She also said, you know, you should stop by Oxford while I'm here. Um, I have to blame these gentlemen who uh, helped me to uh, first meet Lynn, but also made sure that Lynn was productive. Dick Young on the far left uh, was the person at NASA who had the insight to go ahead and fund her work on serial endosymbiotic theory uh, originally as uh, the, both the uh, exobiology and planetary biology program manager plus the Viking program scientist, uh, a very insightful guy. Don David Shinzi kept it going, and when Don wanted to leave headquarters, he invited me in as a postdoc to run the exobiology program. Um, Lynn and I met during the ISSL meeting in 1986, and she wanted to know who this person was, so of course the first thing she did was invite me to dance, and uh, we worked it from there. Um, Lynn actually also uh, let me know right away that she hated the name exobiology, and that has uh, future implications. I left Michael Meyer in charge, and the astrobiology program was born, and that is one of those things that uh, Lynn got her way. It wasn't going to be called exobiology or exobiology plus anymore, but something else. I'll let other speakers talk about how did we get here, where are we going, and are we alone, although I always hate that last question because it really ought to say, is there anybody else out there, or do we already own it all? Um, we do use knowledge of space environments and knowledge of Earth organisms to try to understand what the potential for life elsewhere is, and knowledge of Earth organisms is, of course, where Lynn did her best work. Um, we always have to be reminded that Earth is not a very nice neighborhood. Uh, it didn't start out well, uh, and it may not end well, uh, but in the meantime, lots of interesting things happen. Other worlds might seem hostile, but the Earth has been hostile. The Earth has got microbes living in places you and I wouldn't even want to go for lunch, um, despite what else is available, whether it's you know volcanic vents or whether it's someplace else. We also should remember that it was particularly apt that Lynn was in the geosciences department here because the first deep sea hydrothermal vents were in fact discovered by a boatload of geologists who went out to find out about geophysical cooling of the ocean. So we're um, sitting on an area with brown incrustations. Oh, I can see shimmering water. Okay. I can see shimmering water over here on the left. So let's show right, uh, right, right out this window. Look right down here on those clams and you can see some shimmering between us and the clam. So Jack Corliss and John Edmonds discovered deep sea hydrothermal vents at the same time that we realized that symbiosis is the rule, not the exception. Uh, and we may all, uh, in fact, never find organisms that don't have some symbiotic potential and component. So life elsewhere in the solar system may be pervasive. Lots of good things on Earth. I won't read them all out to you. You can uh, deal with mine seepage acids with microbes living in them at pHs less than one. Uh, possible present day water on Mars, lots of ice, abundant water in the past, potential open on ocean on Europa. All that's great. 
When I came in, the second time I went to NASA headquarters was not to fund people, but to stop people, or at least that's what the pictures look like. As a NASA planetary protection officer, I had a job uh, to maintain a policy to preserve planetary conditions for future biological and organic constituent exploration and to protect the Earth and its biosphere from potential extraterrestrial sources of contamination. It complied with a treaty. Sometimes it sounds like gobbledygook, but I think that Bart Simpson summed it up best. Science clash should not end in tragedy. <laughs> either way, either for us or for the aliens. Uh, and I love BART for that. Places like the Jovian system or the Galileo spacecraft uh, went out and investigated the uh, bodies that were first discovered but not named by his namesake. Um, Galileo found cracks on Europa, a watery ocean underneath. Uh, we have good evidence that there's in fact a huge ocean, three times as much water as all the Earth's oceans, under the ice on Europa. We have places like Mars with a world full of life, but if there is life on Mars, yeah, that's a, you know, a good hypothesis. Why do we have methane in the atmosphere? Do we have methane in the atmosphere? Is it just serpentization, et cetera? All these things provide for the possibility of Mars, but it also gives us an interesting potential test for the Gaia hypothesis. What are the limits of Gaia? How much can a microbe do if a microbe could do Mars? Um, <laughs> We'll see how all that goes, but uh, it's going to be an interesting season. Now, when we go to study a place like Mars, we have all sorts of things to overcome, including time and space plus funding. Um, sometimes the funding is the hard part, not the easy part. Uh, the easiest way to bring a sample back from Mars, by the way, is just wait. Uh, ALH 84001 was picked up in Antarctica at uh, no transportation cost except for from the ice back to the U.S., um, whether what it had in it was just signs of warm water organics uh, on Mars early in its history or whether or not there was any evidence of microbes, uh, which I'm not very positive about. But warm water and organics is not a bad place to start on a place like Mars. So ALH 84001 is the cheap way to do a sample return. If the cheap way to actually go to Mars is just to stand in place here and wait for a large bolide to impact and knock us off to Mars. Uh, make sure you have your suit on before you go. Um, in theory, of course, the practice of exploring other planets is a, a difficult thing to actually carry out. Uh, this picture is a bunch of Viking scientists voting on what should be done on Mars next. So in theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice they aren't. And Viking went loaded for microbes on Mars and tried to culture microorganisms in a place where we didn't really know what the conditions were. And it's tough, very tough, to even culture the microbes we know are on Earth. Less than 1%, some would say less than one-tenth of 1% of all the microbes on Earth could be cultured in some way. So doing it on Mars was a, a nice idea, but a bridge too far. Uh, on the other hand, we're building now large robotic rovers that are pretty smart, and we're sending them off to places like Mars. These rovers may be the harbingers of future robotic explorers that we'd all be interested in, and we can imagine future generations of robots considering the past organic beings that once were living with them uh, and wondering whether or not humans and robots ever existed on the Earth together. And here's a primitive hunting um, human uh, taking care of this Curiosity rover, which will land on Mars in August. This rover is perhaps the cleanest spacecraft uh, that's ever been sent without being baked in an oven for 54 hours, as the two Viking spacecraft were. It's got to land on Mars in such a way that uh, fewer microbes are on that spacecraft than are in this glass of water. Um, and that's pretty tough to do, and we hope it all works out well with the landing. Meanwhile, planetary protection officers are out there, ESA, NASA, protecting the Earth from the scum of the universe, and vice versa, and we hope uh, that they will continue to succeed. When we look at the potential um, for them not to succeed, one of the things that seems to be a problem in terms of memory here is that the space business is difficult. You have to be careful about things that can happen to good spacecraft. This is the uh, launch directly after the Mars uh, Pathfinder mission was launched. Uh, this is a large uh, Delta rocket blowing up over Cape Kennedy. 
Anyway, of course, there's much to interest astrobiology and others that don't require any protection. Uh, this is the Hubble Space Telescope deep field image. And you can see all those are individual galaxies um, located about 10 billion years back uh, and about 10 billion year, light years away. Um, this is what the galaxy looks like, but the galaxy we're interested in here looks like that. These are microbes, uh, what some would consider the rare biosphere on Earth, and each of them, in fact, contains a galaxy of information that we'd love to know more about. They're out there. All the microbes that have ever lived on Earth are probably still around in one form or another. As Lynn said, we keep the old ones and just add the new. There are places on Earth where everything that's ever lived on Earth can find a living right now, uh, and whether or not we take care of the Earth or whether or not we let it go back to one of those former ages uh, remains to be seen. But the microbes won't care, we will. So we take care of this planet, the moon, uh, planetary protection is about that. Um, and in the meantime, thank you, Lynn, for uh, making it such an enjoyable ride.